the narrative surrounding it is that it's a transformational event where, you know, the leadership makes really, really big decisions about the future course of the economy. It's possible that there will be retaliatory measures against Germany or against um, Germ individual German companies. So leaders of China's ruling Communist Party are gathering in Beijing for a meeting called the Third Plenum. No one knows how decisions get made by this highly secretive Communist Party. But the closed door meeting, which runs until Thursday, is closely watched for clues as to how these decisions get made. Chinese leader Xi Jinping wants to revitalize flagging economic growth. And here to explain it all for us is author and economist George Magnus. Hello, George. So maybe we can kick off and you can explain to us what happens at these plenums and why are they so important? Well, it's um, it's the probably the most important of the seven plenums that take place in each uh, five year political cycle um, <clears throat> of the Central Committee. And each one is numbered, um, which relates to um, the, the five year period. So we're now coming up to the 20th Congress of the Central Committee. So this will be the 20th third plenum. Um, and it's it has a reputation of being the most important because the narrative surrounding it is that it's a transformational event where you know the leadership makes really, really big decisions about the future course of the economy and of the party and so on. In truth, um, it, it, it does have one or two meetings which have been mm -hmm. truly transformational. One of them was in 1978 when uh, Deng Xiaoping confirmed what had already been decided at a prior meeting of the um, uh, party, which was this uh, slogan about reform and opening up. And it's possible that the one in 1993, uh, in which um, uh, Zhang Zemin and sort of presided over the, the launch or the, con uh, the, the confirmation really of what they called the socialist market economy, um, was also a very important third plenum. Um, but most of the others actually either were not about the economy at all, uh, they were mainly about kind of political issues, or they were about rural development, or in the case of 2013, which was the one that took place 10 years ago, um, I mean, it was greeted with great fanfare and there was liberalisation of foreign investment and of um, foreign exchange regulations and of some property rights. Um, there was a big sort of... Um, brouhaha about, you know, markets being accorded a, a decisive role in the conduct of Chinese policymaking. But most of what happened, or rather didn't happen afterwards, was a big disappointment. There really wasn't that much in economic reform. But, um, you know, hope springs eternal. And many people think that um, this week's meeting will be a source of transformational change. We'll see. It's kind of incredible, really, how decisions in the world's second biggest economy are effectively made in secret. And we have to sort of scour around looking for nuggets of information in what is in what is a very much an arcane process that takes place in a black box. Um, I think the background to this meeting, of course, is that China's economic growth slowed to 4.7 percent in the second quarter from a year earlier. Um, what sort of um, what sort of measures do you think that they will they will come up with to, to deal with this. I mean, these, these events can be very vague and procedural, um, but do you expect this plenum to be a game changer in terms of coming up with measures to deal with this slowing growth? Yeah, so I was just going to follow on by saying, uh, just as sort of a, a preamble to answering your question, that actually, um, I mean, these meetings are held in secret and there's sort of a great anticipation about the press release and the readout and the documents that will come out um, on the last day and in the next kind of week or month, actually, in fact. Um, but a lot of what th this is not a random meeting in which, you know, we will be surprised by decisions uh, because most of what is going to take place is well rehearsed. It's been orchestrated. It's really the opportunity for the leadership to present to the Central Committee plans and proposals, much of which we know quite a lot about already. Um, but inevitably, there will be um, speculation about what new things will be announced or what things will be announced that we hadn't necessarily anticipated. So there might be some specific 
um, policy measures or outlines of policy measures, for example. But I think that what we're going to see is uh, confirmation, really, as the centerpiece of Chinese economic thinking for the future of um, uh, what Xi Jinping has called high quality development or alternatively known as the new development concept, in which one of the key features is something which he has labeled uh, as of a year ago as so-called new productive forces. This is really about the elevation of science and technology um, in China um, in order to basically create um, a, a stronger communist party and a China which will eclipse the United States and other Western countries um, in terms of the dominance of advanced technology. Now, whether that actually happens, of course, is a different question altogether. Um, but I think that will be this, this will be the centerpiece of the third plenum. Yeah, you've mentioned there um, about various points of industrial policy and then looking at, at technology in particular. And one area that one goal they set in China is being technologically self-sufficient by 2035. This is really interesting. Do you think that this means that foreign firms have got 10 years left in China before all their technology has been absorbed by the uh, Communist Party and um, that um, it'll totally be a domestic market? Or do you think 2035 means uh, something else? Um, that's kind of a harsh way of looking at it, but I, but it's not entirely without justification. I mean, um, obviously, Chinese China's government has had for some considerable period of time the objective of having a very, very high market shares in leading technology. So, um, I mean, it wasn't all that long ago, maybe about 10 to 15 years ago, uh, they were articulating the campaign about strategic emerging industries uh, made in China 2025, which was uh, obviously this big policy that was uh, launched in 2015, was also about you know getting 70%, 75% market share in about a dozen leading technologies. So the goal uh, clearly is to, to be um, self-sufficient or at least um, much less reliant on the United States and other leading industrial countries um, by 2035 and to have established um, certainly leadership in these industries by 2035 and dominance by 2049, which is the centenary of the founding of the PRC, of the People's Republic. Um, so I think um, the party is very serious about these goals. Uh, I mean, about achieving, you know, about the intention to achieve them, at least. Um, and um, the welcome mat is certainly out for foreign firms still um, to the extent that they can help the party realise these goals. I mean, we shouldn't be under any illusion that actually that the party welcomes foreign firms, um, you know, to get rich and to take market share in China. That's not what they want, what they're there for. They're there to basically provide the infrastructure, so to speak, the commercial infrastructure, the governance infrastructure, and the uh, competition in a way uh, for Chinese firms to get better and learn more and acquire more technology uh, to realize these goals that the leadership has set. Yeah, we, we've seen a, a fair amount of wooing of foreign firms in, in recent year, in recent months. Um, I wonder, is that going to keep going? And because um, they, they need foreign direct investment as well as the technology transfer. And then at the same time, you had last week Germany closing a deal with telecom providers to exclude companies like Huawei from the nation's 5G network from 2029. What sort of impact do you think this will have on trade relations between Germany and indeed Europe and Beijing? And how will it affect the sort of the, the, uh, the overall business climate between China and, and the West? Well, of course, um, there's a sort of rather inauspicious background to this because the Chinese government and the EU Commission are already kind of locking horns a little bit over the EU Commission's proposals to introduce um, tariffs on uh, Chinese electric vehicles. Um, and so there is, uh, and there's also sort of other trade tension that extends to other products as well. Um, so this um, uh, decision by the German government to, uh, over a period of years, 
to remove Huawei from the um, uh, telecommunications infrastructure in the country, of course, will not sit happily with China. And they've already made their displeasure quite, um, quite strongly worded and, and strongly felt. Um, it's possible that there will be retaliatory measures against Germany or against um, Germ individual German companies. Um, but And there is a lot of form for China to do this against countries that have um, not kind of uh, fallen into line, so to speak, with um, with the government's wishes or um, or policies. Uh, so, you know, Japan, South Korea, Australia, uh, Philippines, um, Canada, lots of countries. Uh, United States, of course, um, have been um, targeted before. But we should remember, really, that, um, you know, Whilst we are dependent um, in, in many respects on China, um, where our companies are for selling products and generating revenues abroad, uh, China is also dependent on the EU for markets, for selling stuff. Um, it sells a lot of stuff to the EU and to, to Germany and so on. So um, there is kind of leverage that really works in both directions. And some of the measures which the Chinese government may, may be tempted to uh, introduce against Germany, if it chose to, um, may not last very long and they may not be particularly effective anyway. Right. Well, George, let's look at something that we've we've spoken about many times at this stage, but it's the throbbing headache that China cannot seem to shake, which is the dire real estate market. And China's home prices are continuing to fall and the data make for grim reading. Do you think there's any way out of this or is China just going to look somewhere else to find growth? Uh, well, I think there are kind of palliative ways uh, that the government could try to um, lessen the kind of detrimental impact that the downturn in property is having on the economy. Um, so, some measures, of course, it's already taken. It's um, uh, relaxed mortgage interest rate uh, regulations, uh, property purchase regulations. It's provided liquidity to property developers. Um, it's encouraged uh, local governments um, and um, developers to try to accelerate the completion of pre-sold homes to um, citizens who've already paid um, to buy houses that may not have even been built yet. So these kinds of measures have been um, kind of in the pipeline, as it were, for over a year or perhaps longer. Uh, but the property market, as you say, is still in dire condition. Um, and I think it's not a problem which is going to be, which is not going to go away very quickly because um, in the first place, the demographics are just awful. So the, the, the cohort of first time buyers, which are aged 25 to 35, say, um, is going to decline steadily over the next 10 to 25 years. Um, Plus, we've reached really the end of what I think is has been a sort of a land-based development model for China for the last 20 or 30 years, um, in which local governments and local government financing vehicles have been instrumental in the construction of real estate projects, uh, infrastructures to support them, and uh, all the kind of overbuilding and misallocation of capital uh, which which are now really part of the problem uh, that the Chinese government are having to deal with. So I do think the government needs to try to address this. Um, I mean, the IMF has estimated that uh, trying to fix the problem uh, broadly defined to mean not just real estate, but also overbuilding in infrastructure as well um, through tax and um, other measures might cost about a trillion US dollars, which would be about 5% of GDP. Um, but the government shows no willingness or uh, preparedness at this juncture uh, to be, you know, to want to do anything on this scale. Um, <clears throat> and they don't even regard the debt of local government financing vehicles as part of local and provincial government liabilities. So there's a sort of a, a chasm, really, I would say, between what, um, let's say, you know, the IMF and Western trade economists believe to be the answer to the problem, which is really to recapitalize the developers, inject a lot of money into the problem, accept write-offs and um, bankruptcies as part of the issue of dealing with excess 
inventory of housing and supply. And the Chinese government's um, own view about this, which is that it can manage the process, it doesn't need to do these things on that sort of scale, and that gradually, you know, the problem will dissipate over time. Um, I mean, there's, as I said, there's a chasm between these two points of views, and we'll see really in the third plenum how seriously or how um, urgently, shall I say, the government proposes to address the issue of this demand supply imbalance in the property market, which is pretty st serious still. And prices, as you say, are still falling and housing uh, households are uh, really suffering a bit of a lack, not a bit, but a lot of lack of confidence in the property development sector and in getting the houses built that they've already paid for. Um, related to this, we've seen how China's consumption has also been weakening. And um, in the second quarter, household spending slowed to 5% year on year, while income decelerated to 4.5% year on year. So consumer demand for commodities is also weak. Um, given that we have all of these problems facing China at the moment, um, you know, retail sales are down, consumption, the property market, what do you think the plenum can actually do to, to turn things around? Well, <clears throat> that's the 64 trillion yuan question, really, uh, because I think what a lot of economists, not just outside China, but also some kind of think tank and uh, academic economists in China have also articulated, is that China needs to change its development model, right? So the, the consumer sector is repressed, the income generation in China, which basically will would fuel higher consumer spending over time needs to be strengthened. There probably has to be some shift in ownership of uh, assets from the public sector to stronger hands in the private sector. Um, and there has to be a kind of a, uh, a, an overhaul really about um, social welfare and about um, the financing arrangements between central and local governments. Local governments account for 85% of uh, public expenditure on goods and services, uh, but only account for about a half of the revenues, if that, uh, raised in the economy. Uh, so, the, it, I mean, for a lot of economists, the third plenum should be an occasion, should be an event uh, at which the government would basically acknowledge the problems that it has presided over uh, and resolve to change the basis of the development model by prioritizing things that it has not hitherto deemed sufficiently important to prioritize, which is consumption services, private enterprise, and private income formation. Instead, um, Xi Jinping has basically rallied um, or tried to rally public support and party support behind this uh, campaign for new productive forces, which is really about science and technology, and um, behind what the government has or the party has consistently uh, prioritized, which is what they call supply side structural reform. So the, the difference in perception is that, you know, I, for example, think that demand weakness is a critical failure of the Chinese economy. They think that the, I, the way to fix this is to improve the regulatory environment, the red tape, incentives for companies, corporate governance laws, make the party stronger, make it more effective. Um, so this is a very, very kind of different uh, view about how to evolve China's economy over the next 10 to 15 years. And I think what we'll hear at the third plenum is very much a reiteration of new productive forces, science and technology, supply side reforms, more of the same, basically, that we've been listening to for the last um, five years, at least. The urge to maintain the status quo at the top of the Communist Party, contrasting with the need for change in the Chinese development model. George Magnus, thanks for your time. Thank you.